Good morning. I am Nita Weber, and I am the ADA Compliance Program Administrator with the Texas Department of Transportation. I am excited to bring you the first in a series of webinars this month. July marks the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, as we refer to it, ADA. So happy birthday, ADA. 21 agencies and organizations from across the state are celebrating with this series of virtual workshops throughout the month, culminating in a big Texas style celebration on Friday, July 24th. We will bring you a series of notable disability advocates sharing their experience with the ADA, what it was like to see it implemented, how it has furthered the civil rights of Americans with disabilities, and where it still needs to go. After that, we will take a virtual tour of Texas with brief ADA birthday wishes from local disability advocates across the state. To find out more about these sessions, a link will be shared with you in the chat box. Today's topic is curb ramps, sidewalks, oh my, navigating the public rights of way in Texas. Our speaker is Pete Krause with the Texas Department of Transportation. Now I will turn it over to Pete. Yes, thank you, Nita. Again, my name is Pete Krause. I work in the design division of TxDOT here in Austin, Texas. And one of my tasks um, that I work on has been working in the public rights way and working on accessibility issues and um, so forth, and um, mainly wanted to talk about a project we've been working on that is um, bringing our, basically doing an inventory of the system and seeing where our issues are related to accessibility so that we can expand and, and bring our system um, into compliance and also to expand and, and add opportunities for folks, pedestrians primary to navigate safely in the public rights way. So with that, um, basically what I wanna do is talk about um, what is considered state right of way versus what are local streets, be it the city or county roads in, in a particular area. I wanna talk about our data collection efforts and some of the things, um, you know, the methodology we've used to do that data collection some of the common findings, which I'm sure you're, you all are well aware of some of the findings that, that you might expect that we would find. We'll talk about some of the solutions and some of the ways that we can sort of remedy um, some, of the, some of the things that we found out there. We also wanna talk about some potential feedback loops, uh, public input, public outreach and so forth um, that, that we also intend to do as part of this initiative, as well as some other initiatives that we have going on at the Department of Transportation. And then we'll finally, uh, sort of at the end, do a wrap up and hopefully have time for some questions if you guys have questions. Um, so with that, um, again, we are in the process of revamping our self-evaluation and our transition plan. And so the design division of TxDOT has been working on a process uh, to, to update the existing, we had an existing pedestrian access inventory, but we wanna, our, our, our task right now is to update that. And so that we're in the process of evaluating all of the TxDOT owned rights away. We're also gonna provide some long-term pedestrian facility planning and develop a strategy and some strategies to come into 100% ADA compliance. We've also created uh, some tools to um, help us plan that work and to estimate what, what the costs are for some of that work. We also wanna be able to check our compliance. It doesn't do us much good to build something if at the end of the day we don't you know, build it properly. So, so we've got some tools to check that compliance and also some tools that we can check our projects. So uh, anyone is interested on what we're up to and how, how we're achieving success, we wanna be able to track um, that remediation of, of the issues. Um, in our 
there's a there's a photo up uh, that shows a shopping center with some accessible parking out front. These are the kind of the facilities that are important for people to be able to get to. Uh, so so we don't while the photo didn't show the connection to the public right away. Hopefully there is. If there's not one, there soon will be. So so that um, you know pedestrians can access buildings and facilities from the uh, public right away. So the first thought I wanted to make sure we understand is that, that we're the State Department of Transportation, and so we're responsible for a whole series of roads that are under our ownership and under our control. However, there are a lot of state roadway, uh, excuse me, roadways in the state that are either under city purview or county purview. Um, so uh, I, I wanna make the distinction between what we're doing in the Department of Transportation, our inventory and our uh, process, um, and, and make that distinction between what is the state and what is the local. Now we do have uh, some funding opportunities for the local governments to uh, to work on things, but, but um, is, is sort of monumental as our efforts were, um, it, it in no way captured everything, you know, in the state of Texas. So what I've got shown up here is a chart, uh, basically with, a, with three counties, Dallas County, Harris County, and Travis County listed. And we've got the mileage, basically what's under state control or state owned roads versus what is under uh, local control or local owned roads. Um, so, so the miles, and I'll just, I'll just um, read the footnote, the miles are, are basically what we call centerline miles, meaning, say, if I, you know, wanted to walk I-35 in Dallas County and I started at the south end of Dallas County and walked that, that section of I-35, it would be about 34, 35 miles. So that's the center line miles. It doesn't really take into account the number of lanes and so forth and so on. So our, our uh, again, the top row, Dallas County, first column, 802 miles. That's how many miles, that's how many center line miles of roadway are under state jurisdiction. Second column, that's only 8.9% of the total miles in Dallas County. So the local miles are 8,184 or 91.1% of the total. So you can see even though the state has a lot of busy roads and a lot of roadways, we in no way encompass all of the, all of the city streets or county roads uh, in, in that particular county. Harris County, where Houston is, is the second row. Um, obviously very populated county. Uh, in Harris County, first column, we have 1,302 state-owned or controlled miles, again, centerline miles of roadway, which is 8.8% of the total. Uh, the roadways in Harris County in column three, under local control, lo local jurisdiction, 13,459 miles, or again, about 91.2% of the total mileage. So as you can see, even though we've got a lot of work to do in Harris County, um, the state by, by no means is, is going to fix everything. So that's why it's incumbent on, you know, us working with the locals, the cities, the counties, and so forth uh, to, to, to help bring um, those accessibility issues um, front and center. Travis County, at three Travis County in uh, the third column, is where Austin is located in Travis County. Just uh, state miles is 619 uh, or 12% of the total in, in Travis County. Um, 4,236 under local control or 87.3%. And I happen to know that, that the, the Travis County maintains about 1,250. So roughly 3,000 miles are under the various cities, jurisdictions um, in in Travis County. So again, I just sort of wanted to give brief y'all. So so as and and we'll go through some of our efforts that we've done at the state uh, as far as our collections. But we have no no means captured everything in this 
in the state of Texas. So what did we collect? We basically, uh, and we had a previous inventory of our curb ramps uh, that we did back in uh, early 2000, it was 2001 and 2002 in that time frame. So it's about tw almost 20 years old data. Uh, it was, we had some problems with the collection back then. So we wanted to recollect all of our curb ramp data, but we also wanted to include uh, a collection of the sidewalk data, uh, transit stops. We know that transit stops are very critical to a lot of, of transportation needs. And, and we also collected some of the information on our traffic signals, primarily the pedestrian push buttons. So if you're a pedestrian and you need to get across the street and you need to know where those buttons are, if the buttons are there, where are they? Uh, what happens if I push them? Um, you know, in, in, so, so we've collected a certain amount of data uh, related to the traffic signals in the pedestrian interface. We also incidentally, uh, because we were out looking at the entire facility, we went ahead and collected uh, information on the bicycle facilities. That's not really my area of expertise or my purview, but since we were out there collecting sidewalk data, it made sense for us to collect uh, bicycle facility data, which, which we as a state don't have. And that's a whole nother seminar for a later day. So on our curb ramp collection, um, basically we sent it field teams to every corner on the state highway system to collect the data. What you're seeing is a photo actually taken, this is actually on Google Earth Maps or Google Maps. Uh, so the Google car actually uh, took a picture of one of our field collection teams that happened to be down on US 183 in Luling, Texas. So you can see uh, as the photo, in the photo, there, it's a busy corner. There's sort of a little street shop right adjacent to it. So lots of cars parked in there. So it's a busy little corner, even in the small town of Luling, Texas. So we have one, one of our field teams is got a smart level that he's checking um, the, the slopes of, of the various act aspects of the curb ramp. And we've got another person on the field team, again, in safety vest and hard hats, who's got a handheld uh, device where we actually have the data collection app loaded. So he's going through and recording what the one gentleman is, is telling him, you know, widths and slopes and, you know, all the features of that curb ramp. So, so as one guy's, you know, calling out the, um, calling out the, the criteria, the other person on the team is recording that. And these are uh, all done with geo uh, locating devices. In other words, as he's recording that, the system knows exactly where he's standing. And so we can map that on a, on, um, in what we call a geodatabase. So we can tie that information actually to the roadway. Now, looking at this photo, it, again, it's a street, uh, sort of an open air market. Uh, and I don't know if that's, there, there's a woman walking out. I don't know if she was a customer or the owner or what, but it's uh, a lot of flowers and some flower pots and some ornate stands and so forth. Unfortunately, they're cluttering the sidewalk and blocking access, but um, that unfortunately was not something that we would have necessarily recorded as a permanent, um, a permanent obstruction, but it, it certainly could be construed as an obstruction. So that's what our curb ramp, um, basically our methodology for collecting curb ramps. We actually sent teams out, um, walked the corners, recorded uh, a number of um, features uh, that we could do our analysis on to see uh, if we were in compliance and where the, where the problems were. So this is a, 
what I've got shown up here is a clip, is a basically a screenshot of showing, uh, this is actually from the, the application that's showing um, some of the, of the factors that the uh, the factors that we collected data on. For instance, or just for example, for our curb ramps, we actually collected uh, 60 data points for each uh, curb ramp. Uh, you, you can imagine the, the lengths and the widths and the slopes and the cross slopes and the flares and the landings, lengths and widths and, and so forth. So I won't go through the entire list, but there was, um, there were there were 60 data points that we collected on the curb ramps, and, and one of the one of the um, ideas we used was we've got about 14 initial data points, uh, primarily the critical widths and critical slopes and the landing presence and so forth. So we had about 14 initial data points. And if that ramp failed those initial points, then we didn't bother collecting the other 46 data points because I know that that ramp needs to be replaced. It's, um, it's, it's just uh, you know, not, not a good ramp and needs to come out. So, so the, I'm actually showing the, the, these data points for a particular curb ramp and I don't have the where it was or anything like that shown but um, so on on my on my data set the ramp length was 50 inches which is okay the ramp width in this case was 56 inches which is okay however the third uh, criteria down the ramp slope we measured at 15.9 percent sloped ramp so right away I know that ramp needs to be replaced. Okay, there is no way I can fix a 15.9% slope, which is almost twice the allowable maximum slope is of 8.3% slope. Um, so I really didn't need all the rest of the information because I could log that ramp as non-compliant, needs to be replaced, and I know then I can sort of work on the cost and so forth based on uh, based on that knowledge. So that was our methodology for uh, curb ramp collection. We did a pretty detailed quali qualitative, uh, quantitative analysis, excuse me. So I have the facts and figures uh, the actual dimensions, if you will. So if standards change, we all know the PROAG sort of in, in its draft, the, the, the public right-of-way uh, accessibility guidelines are in draft. So if something changes that, that, you know, in the allowable slopes or widths and so forth, I can go back and recalculate uh, all my data based on uh, those changes to the standards. So that was the reason we went into uh, uh, the detail that we went into. Uh, again, I can also use um, sort of those differences as a prioritization. In other words, if I've got a ramp that's way too steep, I'm gonna bump that to a higher priority than one that's just barely out of compliance. Even though I know it needs to be replaced, um, I, I feel like that we can uh, sort of prioritize those ramps that really need our attention early on. So that was uh, sort of basically our curb ramp methodology for, for collecting that data. As I mentioned, we also wanted to collect the data on the sidewalks and shared use paths. So we had basically two sort of philosophies on collecting that data. And we, do, we basically divided the sidewalk collection again, into what we called a visual data collection, which is sort of a glorified windshield survey, if you will, uh, on, on parts of the system that we knew were in pretty good shape, maybe had a few issues. Uh, you, you can actually um, you know, collect a lot of data um, from a slow moving vehicle. So, so that was our philosophy on this visual data collection, where we basically drove, um, dr drove the system, and I've got the photo 
a little photo on the left, and I apologize, it's sort of small and dark, but basically it's a view from the vehicle outside the passenger side vehicle where they were look, you know, sort of slowly driving and actually marking again via a a tablet and a geo-referenced application. They were actually marking the things that they could see, be it obstructions be it the, the heaves or vertical discontinuities in the sidewalk, the visible slope issues. So you can, you can see things that look like they're pretty steep slopes. You can, you can pick those out. So again, in the photo, um, I don't know if you, you can barely see it, but we have mounted to the outside um, of the vehicle is again, a video camera, a GoPro type camera that was uh, again, a GPS camera, so the camera knows where it is and, uh, you know, how fast it's moving and so forth. So on the right-hand photo is basically a screenshot, again, of that tablet data. Um, in, th in this case, it was a, a video from inside the vehicle, so we, so we had one operator driving the vehicle, of course, watching, you know, watching out, making sure he was driving in a safe manner. We had a, a second individual um, sort of running the the collection application and the camera and so forth. So on the on the right hand side, you can see if it's a there's a photo looking out the passenger vehicle window. Uh, there's a sidewalk parallel to a look like a residential street. We see a couple of pedestrians walking um, down the sidewalk, and uh, below is sort of a graph of the speed. Again, it's a GPS camera, so the the, it's recording data even as we're recording the video. So it knows where it is. It knows where it is on in, in the real world, uh, so to speak. So again, we were looking at the things that were pretty obvious from a vehicle uh, and, and the application was set up. So if they saw something that needed a little further in, investigation, they could actually stop the vehicle, get out, do some detail measurements, actually record that data um, you know in into the application so we felt like a lot of the system particularly the newer sidewalks this was this was an adequate enough um, you know data data collection for a lot of, of sidewalks the other um, the other component is a detail sidewalk if you'll flip the next slide So our detail collection, we actually used a couple of different tools to do um, a detailed analysis. Um, again, it's, it's a continuous evaluation of you know, running slopes, cross slopes, any heaves in the sidewalk. And we, when, when I say heave, I mean that those vertical discontinuities, uh, we were looking at crosswalks, driveways, again, obstructions, overhead obstructions or, um, you know, blocking the blocking the path type of obstructions. So the we've got one photo. The sort of in the center of the page is what is known as an ultralight inertial profiler or ULIP for short, and it's basically a segue device. Uh, some of you may have seen this. It's it was developed out of Washington State. Um, so it's got some equipment built on there with some. Um, with some gyroscopes so it can detect slopes, it can uh, side, you know, cross slopes, longitudinal slopes. And, and in, again, there's a, there's a, basically an iPad or a, um, a, a tablet attached to the device. So the, so the, the operator, uh, in this case, we've got a, a guy again in safety gear operating, um, operating the Segway, driving down the sidewalk and he is logging you know, not only continuously logging the slopes and widths and so forth, he's also looking for obstructions, uh, overhead obstructions, be it, you know, trees or shrubs or signs, that kind of thing that would be uh, encroaching onto the, onto the circulation path. So he's recording all of that as he goes along. And this was pretty efficient. Um, these guys were able to log you know, 12, 13 miles a sidewalk a day, which is, which is pretty, which is pretty good. That's a, that's a lot of data that, that he's able to collect in a, in a fairly short period of time. One of the other 
uh, methodology we used is called a LIDAR, which is a light detection and ranging. It's basically um, a, a, a very high tech, uh, it's not technically, I don't think radar, but it's basically it goes out um, and collects all of the points in real time that can be tied again, tied into a survey. Um, so, um, in, in what we're showing on the, on the right hand side is actually a screen capture of that LIDAR information. And it looks like a photograph. You can actually see the, a, a tree and the curbs, and you can actually see the stripes on the road, but it's actually a point cloud. It's basically just a cloud of points with real, uh, coordinate data, both both in vertical and horizontal data, so we can actually go in there and measure slopes, measure widths, measure uh, obstructions, do all sorts of measuring from the comfort of uh, your office environment versus being, you know, sort of standing out there in traffic, um, ha having to collect and, and taking the chance on missing something. So this, this LIDAR is, uh, is really pretty comprehensive, pretty, pretty high-tech solutioning for um, doing survey data. And we use it all the time on, on various uh, roadway construction type projects. So uh, again, it's given us real-time recordable information on the condition of the sidewalk systems. So those, those were sort of basically our two sidewalk collections. As I mentioned, we also collect information on transit stops, uh, bus stops primarily uh, is what we have on our system. So we were looking at all the, um, all those measurements that would be in compliance with, again, with the PRO Ag or the public right of way guidance, uh, talking about the boarding areas or lighting areas. Um, we're also looking and measuring that connectivity to the street or to the sidewalk system. Uh, so we've got a lot of transit stops that are on our uh, system that are not connected to the right of way. So if you happen to be unlucky enough to get off the bus onto one of these islands, if you will, um, you, you know, and no place to go, you basically just sort of have to sit there and wait for the next bus and uh, roll the dice on the next stop. And, so, so we're really, really interested in making sure our transit stops uh, have that connectivity, uh, you know, to, to the rest of the, of the system. I mentioned the pedestrian push buttons. We're looking at compliance with both the, um, both the um, you know, accessibility issues, but also with the, what, what is known as the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices or the MUTCD. Um, which, which has guidance on where the buttons need to be, you know, how far displaced from the curb ramps can they be, should they be, uh, you know, we obviously want them mounted close to the intersection, close to those departure points. So we're looking at the actual physical location of those buttons, um, you know, the height, the mounting height, are they accessible, are they within reach ranges, is there uh, adjacent to a landing or a clear space? And then again, the presence of uh, the accessible pedestrian signals. You know, are they in compliance with the audible and the vibrotactile uh, requirements, you know, as well as the um, sort of the visual components in the highway system. So we were recording all of that. So we have a good idea of, uh, again, where we need to work on um, you know bringing bringing our traffic signal um, predict, predict the pedestrian traffic signals uh, in into compliance. So just to give you sort of an idea, again the collections are not in 100% finished, but we're 95% done. Um, so just to give you, I've got a got a um, a graph uh, or a, a little table here with our facility types and how many we've completed. So in the column one, we've got curb ramps. So far, we've collected information on 139,768 curb ramps. And I think we're, that's about the number we sort of expected. That's, that's 
about the number that was in our data base previously. Um, so so that, that should be a, a pretty good number. It stops um, so there's there's quite a transit stop around the state. Push buttons we've collected uh, row three. The push buttons we've collected forty three thousand six hundred ninety three uh, data points or, or not data points. That's the push button um, push buttons we've collected. And then again the sidewalk miles four thousand seven hundred sixty eight miles to date. We're not, again, we're not 100% through with all of the data collection um, on, on those miles of sidewalk. Um, and just for instance, we collected about 1,500 miles were done on that visual um, collection and about 3,200 3, or so miles were collected with the detailed um, side sidewalk system. So that, that sort of gives you an idea about about a third of them were done with the visual application, about two thirds, uh, you know, roughly with the uh, detailed analysis. So that, that's sort of the scope of what we've been, um, our data collection to date um, so far. Again, we're not 100% we're not there, but we're, we're pretty close. So what are we finding? Uh, as you guys can find um, some lack of existing curb ramps. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to hard to believe. Thirty years in, we're still missing curb ramps, but um, I, I'm sorry to say that we are. Uh, we have a lot of slope issues, both the longitudinal in the slope in the direction you're traveling, plus the cross slope issues. Um, one of the other things that, that we found, and I knew we were going to find because in, in the early days, in the, in the 1990s, shortly after the ADA was passed, we did a lot of, we built a lot of curb ramps, but we didn't understand, we didn't have a good grasp on what those standards really were and how they were really needed to be laid out. So we built a lot of curb ramps without any landing really didn't connect to an accessible um, you know, piece of sidewalk up top. So we've been in the process of replacing a lot of those ramps that were built you know, 25 and, and 30 years ago um, and, and doing a better job, I feel like, I hope we are anyway, of, um, of, of getting those landings um, uh, back in shape. One place where detecting a lot of problems is sort of at that grade at the bottom of a curb ramp where it ties to the street. Uh, we, we still end up with a lots of steep slopes and, and sort of vertical displacements. Again, those vertical bumps, uh, which make it very hard for somebody to, you know, particularly in a wheelchair to use that momentum of the cross slope of the, of the roadway to sort of push, you know, help you accelerate up that ramp. Uh, it's hard to do when you've got bad slopes and bumps and so forth at the at that at that great where those two grades meet sort of in the in the gutter. Um, ponding can be an issue. Um, it's just unfortunately one of those things that's sort of tough to get a handle on. So I've got a, three photos here in the in the slide. The first photo shows. Uh, probably a fairly decent curb ramp. Unfortunately, there's a big open drainage grate right at the bottom of the ramp that doesn't appear to be compliant. So anybody sort of using mobility device, a crutch or cane or, or walker is likely to have severe problems at the bottom of that ramp because this grate just extends the full width of, of the curb ramp. Uh, with with openings that don't appear to be compliant with with any standards, so that that's a problem. This, the the middle photo uh, shows sort of a quasi maybe somebody's idea of a curb ramp. It does um, the sidewalk parallel 
roadway to an intersection, then the sidewalk takes a 90 degree turn to cross the parallel road. There is no provision to cross the perpendicular road. Um, and it looks like it's very poorly maintained, got some, you know, some drop offs at either side of it. So it's just not a good safe um, situation. You may be able to negotiate it if you're lucky, but it's just not a good, um, a good situation. And then the third photo on, on the right hand side shows a sidewalk again coming down parallel uh, residential, looks like a residential street. And then all of a sudden it just, the sidewalk dies into this bed of gravel. And so I'm not sure if it was once a curb ramp that got torn up by somebody or if it was never there. Uh, again, extremely hard to negotiate for, uh, for any of us. Uh, cer certainly, uh, you know, a pedestrian in a wheelchair would have a tough time negotiating this gravel patch sort of at the end of the sidewalk. So these are the kind of things we're logging and we're um, sort of intending to fix. Some, some of the main things we're finding with the curb ramp. As far as our sidewalk findings, uh, again, cross slopes, particularly cross slopes at driveways is a, is a big, big problem. Um, we're, we're, we're finding those, a lot of those, way too many. And those were also um, determined that those can be pretty expensive fixes because you, you basically have got to rebuild that driveway and, and in a lot of cases sort of build it, you know, replace the entire driveway and in some cases building back into the, uh, you know, into private property. Uh, obstructions, there's plenty of obstructions. Um, um, plenty of, again, the heaves or the vertical discontinuities and settlement issues. Any of y'all who happen to reside sort of in that black clay gumbo belt that, that seems to occupy about a third of the state with a you know big heavy clay soils you know every time it rains they move up and down and the sidewalks don't always move with them or they'll they'll move one direction but not sort of sort of um sort of go with the with the with the movement of the soil so we end up with heaves and and this again vertical displacements and settlements so, so the picture at the bottom shows a typical driveway where the st slopes are too steep. The sidewalk approaches on each side. There's really no connection for, um, you know, a, a, an accessible connection across that driveway. Uh, again, so that's, that's, a, um, that's a, gonna be a fairly major fix. Uh, on the top right, we have a photo of an obstruction, basically a power pole right in the middle of what appears to be about a four foot sidewalk. We've got a two or three foot power bowl right in the middle of the sidewalk, obviously rendering that entire sidewalk system, system inaccessible or section inaccessible. Um, that one probably would be a fairly easy fix just to sort of take the sidewalk around the pole. Um, so that uh, again, but, but, renders that entire length of sidewalk unusable to, 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 a lot, to a lot of pedestrians. And then the bottom photo on the, on the, the bottom right shows an extreme heave. Uh, you know, I don't know what caused this, but basically the sidewalk buckled up probably six inches. Uh, so it's, you got a very steep section of sidewalk with a peak in it. Very difficult to negotiate, um, you know, for, for all of us anyway, but, um, but certainly if you had a, you know, using a mobility device, it would be very difficult to, very treacherous, um, you know, particularly if it were wet or slick in any way, would be, would be a very, um, very difficult um, to, to negotiate. Uh, next slide. Again, some of our common findings on the bus stops, uh, the missing boarding or lighting areas. Uh, the bottom photo shows a, a bus stop, a bus stop bench 
but there's absolutely no sidewalk, no infrastructure, and you can see sort of the beaten path where there's people walking up and down this road, and they're probably walking up and down the road to catch, you know, maybe catching the bus, maybe coming off the bus. Um, obviously non-compliant. Again, you know, if you were headed, there's there's a probably a shopping center or some some facility in the background. If you were trying to exit that bus and get to that facility, uh, you you would be out of luck as far as um, having that compliant access. So we find we're finding a lot of that um, lack of sidewalk leading to those boarding areas. The middle photo. Uh, shows a gentleman in a wheelchair uh, queuing up. Actually, there's a couple of people in wheelchairs queuing up to load on to a, to a local uh, bus, um, a busy little corner. Um, it looks like it's fairly accessible, although there's, it's pretty tight, um, probably not designed for the traffic load that it seems to be, um, seems to be getting. So uh, again, that's something to be mindful of, particularly if you have a busy transit corridor and a busy corridor where pedestrians may be trying to occupy that same space as uh, th this gentleman and the lady are trying to board, um, board the bus. Uh, you know, a lot of congestion, if you will, right at that particular point. And then the third photo on the top uh, shows uh, basically a transit shelter, not really enough space. It's, it's not horrible, but, um, but it's just really not enough, uh, you know, boarding and lighting space to, again, it, it, and you can imagine, well, if it were a crowded situation where people trying to board the, the bus, um, it, it, it could be, uh, it really needs more space. So those are the things we're trying to uh, catch on the bus stops, and we know that the transit corridors are heavy pedestrian generating corridors. Um, just by their nature, um, the you know the buses tend to go where the people are, but they also bring people to to those corridors. So the the, the transit corridors are going to be some of our high priority uh, locations to. to um, start dealing uh, with, with some of these issues. So some of the solutions we're working on, we've had a, what, what's been known as our statewide curb ramp program uh, in place for a number of years, probably 15 years and, and so. Uh, again, we started out primarily looking at curb ramps and we built a lot of curb ramps through the years. But as we built them, we started realizing, you know, we just, just putting these curb ramps in and necessarily getting people to where they need to get to. So we started to want, uh, consider, you know, general pedestrian mobility. Um, are we providing, um, are we providing access for folks to get to where they want to get to? And um, so, so we're, I'm reminded of our TxDOT mission, which is basically connecting you with Texas. So how are we connecting you with the places that you want to go. Uh, so that, that whole mobility issue is, is we're, we're, we're taking a good look at that. Uh, accessibility is gonna be our, our, you know, our standard. Basically, you know, whatever you build or rebuild, it, it, we've gotta meet at least the minimum, um, you know, accessibility um, standards as, you know, as best we can, as, much as practical. Uh, safety is also a big issue. We've had, um, we, we, we of course trend, um, you know, car crashes and vehicular crashes, particularly those fatalities. And the, the vehicular, um, you know, we, we've done a lot of work on vehicular safety. And so those numbers are coming down. Unfortunately, here in the state of Texas, our pedestrian fatalities are going up. So we know that's an area of emphasis that we really need to start working on uh, pedestrian safety. So how do we integrate, you know, we, we need to take a little more holistic approach to our mobility, our accessibility, and our safety. Uh, so, so we're sort of expanding the scope of our projects from just building curb ramps to really starting to make those, uh, make those connections. 
and, and I don't really have a slide showing this, but what basically we're, so we, we, we've done the inventory looking at, um, at the, basically the physical criteria that we're calling our, um, our severity index, if you will. You know, is it too steep? Is it too narrow? Is it, you know, all of those 60 data points plus that, that, that I mentioned earlier, that's sort of what we call our severity index. But again, since we were able to map this, then we can use all sorts of data that's been mapped, uh, be it you know public building locations or uh, you know census data that sort of indicates where where our populations are. Um, we can use that uh, to to help us determine what we call an activity score. Um, you know, is it you know, near the public facilities that, you know, people need to get to. Is it near those, what we call our life services, you know, the grocery stores, the, um, you know, the, the, the drug stores, those type of facilities that we know people need to get to on a regular basis. So by using, you know, sort of developing that activity score, that can also help us prioritize um, projects. And that will also help us uh, in our general roadway reconstruction or construction or reconstruction projects. We're really making, you know, pedestrian activity, you know, absolutely one of the factors that need to be considered on any roadway reconstruction project. Uh, Texas is a big state. We've got a lot of rural roadways. Maybe it doesn't make sense to put the, put the sidewalk out there today, uh, but we also want to um, plan for that future development. You know, who knows when, uh, you know, something's going to be built there, um, and then it would then start to become a pedestrian generator, and then and then would would um, sort of warrant that that sidewalk construction. So we we really want to make the the pedestrian facilities a paramount piece of, you know, any roadway, particularly in the urban areas. Um, we, we've just got to, to incorporate that into our total project planning. Uh, maintenance and operations, we want to, you know, don't forget about accessibility in our, in our routine maintenance and our routine operations. Um, so if you have a little, you know, bad piece of sidewalk in front of your house and you can't get to the grocery store, um, you know, we, we, we want to know that because, you know, I don't need to wait till we have, you know, somebody rebuilds the road in front of your house to fix those kind of things. You know, there's ways that, that we can get those things fixed more on an operational level. Um, and, and we've sort of geared our, uh, you know, our whole philosophy of prioritization around that, um, you know, what is it going to take to fix this thing? Is it a simple fix? Can we get on it tomorrow? You know, can we do it in fairly short order for low money? Or is it something that's really going to have, you know, have, you're going to have to buy right away or, you know, do some major reconstruction to, to actually uh, fix it. So we're, so we're looking at those um, as, as well. Okay. So um, where we're headed again, I, I told you we're just, almost finished and we're ready to start, um, you know, getting some, getting some, doing some public um, outreach, getting some public feedback on our, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate in a little bit. I, I sort of gave you the, the, the quick version today, but, but we can sort of get into the, to the guts of it of, of, you know, how we prioritize, what criteria, what factors we use, sort of get out into the weeds you know, are we making good um, assumptions? Are our assumptions going to play out um, in a in a good, valid uh, way? So, so we want that, and we're gonna we're gonna open up some some dialogue, um, and and we're looking at. Of course, we were actually looking before even the the whole pandemic issue um, sort of sort of came into play. We were looking at various options that we could. Um, you know, open up that communicate those lines of communication, so so we can get feedback from from the public. We can sort of incorporate that into our whole uh, planning process. 
Uh, and again, it's going to be a continuing thing. It's not like we're going to make a decision for the next 10 or 15, 20 years without sort of, you know, rechecking. Are we doing, you know, are we, are, are we accomplishing what we think we're accomplishing? Are we getting, you know, sort of closer to, to that goal line, if you will. Um, again, we've got some other uh, initiatives on the transition planning, and I won't talk about that. Um, hopefully in a later session, we'll be uh, talking about some of that, but there will be definitely, uh, you know, feedback, feedback, sort of that feedback loop as part of our overall planning. Um, so again, that's, that's, um, that's, you know, more to come. Uh, and we will, we will certainly, uh, you know, use whatever resource we can to help open up those lines of communication, uh, you know, be it the governor's office or, or any other number of, you know, organizations where we can sort of help get the word out and get the word back from. So uh, just one more concept, and I'm just throwing this out there because there's been some talk about it really recently, and, and that is this idea of crowdsourcing information uh, where we're basically you know through sort of a voluntary um, effort it's you know using the the sort of the public to help us gather some of some of that information um, one of there was a proposal from the northeast and I, I can't recall if it was Michigan or maybe Wisconsin anyway there was a there was a proposal out to actually use crowdsourcing to help gather that information that we basically um, have been gathering on the sidewalk system. You know, I don't know how that'll work. There's, there's obviously some, um, you know, things to be careful of, but it may be something that would prove um, very valuable. Um, one, of the, one of the things, one of the tools we've been using on the bicycle side is actually a crowdsourcing type of uh, data collection. It's, you know, strictly voluntary. You download the application and uh, I think it's set up so that if you're going on your bike ride or you're heading for work or whatever, you sort of log into the application and then it sort of tracks you um, anonymously, hopefully. Uh, I know there's some issues along, along those lines, but um, we won't get into that today. But, uh, but basically then you know, if enough people are doing it, you start to get a feel for, hey, you know, here's, we need a bicycle facility here because there seem to be a lot of people using this particular corridor, uh, you know, at certain times of the day and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it may be a good source of information. Again, uh, we have not implemented anything like that um, to date, uh, but, but there, there is some talk about it and it may, may be something you hear about in the future. So I just throwing that out again, to, to express our feeling that we really want to open up those lines of communication in, in who knows, there may be some different ways that, that, that we haven't even thought about yet to, to, you know, to be able to get that information back and forth. So um, just thought I'd throw that out there as, as, um, as a potential, you know, who knows what, what the, what the near future will hold for, for some of our information systems. And I think that basically wrapped up my presentation for today. Um, look like I'm pretty close to the time we'd set up. So again, my name is Pete Krause. I work in the landscape architecture section of the design division, which is in our headquarters office uh, here in Austin or in Austin. I don't happen to be in Austin at the moment, but um, we're out of Austin. so. My contact information is there. Um, if if um, if you have information or uh, need information, you can certainly um, contact me. Um, at the moment, I'd like to check to see if there are any questions uh, in the chat box. Okay, Nita, uh, this is Deborah. We have a question from a resident in Williamson County, and uh, the attendee wants to know um, who can they write to in order to get a curb ramp added to a sidewalk? Um, great, great question. Um, the, one, of the, one of the beauties of our 
department is that we're, we're very decentralized. So there should be a local representative. Uh, if you're in Williamson County, um, we have, we have an, actually an area engineer's office there in Georgetown. Um, we have maintenance sections there in Williamson County. So my advice is to start at, at that level, start at the local level. Uh, you know, reach out to, um, you know, if it, if it's a text dot or, you know, again, and hopefully we have those lines of communication between us and be it the, if, it, if you're in the city of um, Georgetown or in a city, you know, it, we, we, we may have to sort of work with that city to get, to get things underway again, depending on sort of where it falls, but, um, my advice is to start at the local level. Again, they can do a lot of things that, you know, we don't need to escalate this up to some, um, you know, some, um, you know, escalate it up farther than it needs to get to. If you call me, the first thing I'm going to do is call them. So, um, so I would advise to start in, in the cities um, should also be, you know, if you're, if you happen to be in a city, they should also have those, you know, they'll, they'll have each other on speed dial, if you will. So, um, so I would, you know, my advice would be, you know, start at the local level. Um, and, it, and if you don't, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't have or able to make that contact, then you can sort of go up to the next level, which would be our Austin district office, um, and get a hold of somebody there. Um, the, TxDOT also has a sort of a centralized, and I think they call it a complaint system, which is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it, it's really not, it doesn't have to be a complaint, but um, sort of a feedback. Um, so if you, I think if you go to, and I'm, I made, I'm speaking off the cuff a bit, so I apologize if I don't get it exactly right. But if you go to TxDOT.gov, there should be a feedback, uh, uh, basically, a place where you can um, put in a request either for information or for uh, help on something. So I would, I would definitely try, um, you know, try reaching out to local level, if not, uh, you know, send something to that, um, to that feedback information at the text.gov and, and it should then tr again, trail back down to the local level where they should be able to help. Thank you, Pete. Deborah, it seems like you have some more questions. The next question we have is, um, what is the accuracy of measurements made using the, I'm sorry, LIDAR, LIDAR point cloud data? Um, the, the, the LIDAR, can actually be survey quality data. And I don't, I don't, I don't have the exact, uh, and I'm not sure we, we tied each one of those point clouds actually down to, you know, the, the, a benchmark, a known benchmark, because basically our concept was that everything is sort of relative to each other. So it really didn't have to, be a real world, you know, X, Y, Z coordinate, but they can easily be tied down to, um, so it, so it's basically survey quality data and, and I, I couldn't quote you on, you know, how many, you know, millimeters or meters or any of that, but it's, but it's, it's pretty accurate, pretty accurate. Next question. And to tag on to that first question, um, you can locate um, contact information for your um, local TxDOT district office on the TxDOT.gov um, website. The next question is uh, related to continuing education. So either Randy or um, Nita can address, are these courses accredited with AIA and or TDLR so they can be counted towards continuing ed requirements? Um, 
I will respond. Uh, no, these courses are not uh, classified as CU uh, credits, but you will be able to receive a certification of attendance at the end of the full series near uh, the end of July. Okay. Which standards, uh, DOJ, DOT, ADA standards, PROAG, NUTCD, TxDOT standard details, did TxDOT use to establish the minimum requirements? For example, does the plan require the sidewalk pedestrian access route clear width to comply with the ADA standards 36 inch minimum width or PROAG's 48 inch minimum width? What about parallel curb ramps, APS, and other elements? So basically our, we want to use the guidance in the PROAG. Uh, again, uh, so actually in, in, a, in a couple of those cases, our TxDOT standards actually exceed the minimums for um, e either the 2010's, you know, ADA standards or the, the you know, the PROAG guidance. So for instance, our sidewalk, TxDOT has a minimum sidewalk width of five feet. So I want to know if any of, you know, if I've got four foot sidewalks out there, which I do, um, I, will, I will know that those do not meet our minimum standard sidewalk widths. Now, are we gonna tear them out to replace them? Eventually, maybe, but, um, but we would certainly, uh, you know, want to know that they're quote unquote deficient as far as our TxDOT standards. And so there's a couple of other instances where our standards actually exceed the minimums. So we, we again, part of the reason we did the, you know, the quantitative analysis so that we could know um, if, you know, if it's, if it's 47 inches width um, you know, versus, you know, 30 inches width. I, I you know, I, I can get a good sense of um, sort of, sort of where that, where that falls. But our, our, all of our, and all of our push at TxDOT is to go to the minimums in the proposed right-of-way um, accessibility guidelines or the PROAG. So that's, that's, that's sort of our quote unquote, that's the guidance we're trying to, trying to meet. Does that answer, hope that answered the question. What ongoing coordination is TxDOT doing with local agencies and their projects? So we have, you know, as part of our overall project coordination, depending on, um, depending on where you are. In other words, we have a pretty good planning outreach just for all projects. Uh, if you're in one of our uh, metropolitan areas, you know, we work a lot through the, what are known as the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations. We work with them. We have a pretty good dialogue with the cities, even if it's in a, a you know, a small rural town. Um, so, and my goal, my goal is to really incorporate the pedestrian infrastructure into everything we do. Every, you know, every project where it's, where it's um, feasible, if you will. Um, so, you know, we, we really strive to open those lines of communications with the locals. We deal with the locals a lot. We've got several other programs that they can actually submit um, projects to uh, for consideration and funding. Uh, so, so hopefully we have opened um, those, those lines of communications with, with the local, be it the local city or the local counties or, or the local, um, um, local governments. Okay, what design strategies may be implemented to proactively avoid the sidewalk heaving caused by expansive soils in order for the sidewalk to remain ADA compliant long term? You know, that's, um, that's, that's a real challenge, particularly as, as you can imagine in certain parts of the state where we have, um, 
really expansive soils. Um, the a lot of it just we just um, you know maybe need to work on our details. Maybe need to do a little more um, a little more subgrade preparation, if you will. Um, you know we we have the same challenges with any roadways. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of times we're, we're actually, um, you know, thickening up the, the concrete basically. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of things that we can do, or maybe we go, you know, maybe we, maybe we go to a more flexible pavement structure. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of things that we can do to alleviate some of those problems. Um, it's, and, and some of them you're not, you know, it just becomes a maintenance problem. You know it's going to fail. Uh, so you just sort of have a routine to, to go in and fix these things as they, as they you know, either heaving or, um, or um, you know, just, just settlement issues. We have a lot of settlement issues uh, around, um, you know, utility structures, utility boxes, and even our own um, sort of culvert or drainage structures, um, you know, getting, getting those densities properly done around structures is tough. It's a tough thing. It's, it's, you know, certainly not the only place we have issues. So I don't, I don't know that I have a great answer, but, um, but it's certainly, you know, something that we do need to work on. Okay, and this is, um, of course, on that topic, how do you go about making sidewalk slash ramp repairs? Do you bring consultants in or is it more of a maintenance operation? Also, do you make all ADA repairs based on connecting point A to B or repair only the worst areas along the corridor? So there's a couple of things in that, in that question. Our, our organization has drifted more to contracting out. You know, we used to have a whole bunch of people who could, who could do concrete work, who could do a lot of work. We've just been, the trend has been to, to you know, contract out more of that uh, type of work. So it's, it's the, the time lag has sort of changed a little bit. But that's not to say we still can't. You know get it done sort of have on-call contractors who can hop in you know sort of as directed and and you know punch out some of those critical uh, problem areas if we do now the second part of the question we understood it was if we do hit a corridor uh, with sort of one of my my intent is to fix everything from as you say from point a to point b i want to take care of everything along a corridor to, to as best I can, um, you know, it may not be a hundred percent compliant, but I'm going to really strive to, to get that hundred percent compliance along the corridor. So, so we really sort of got two, um, two methodologies for, for fixing things. Um, a lot of times if we can go in and do a little saw cutting or take out, you know, a couple of panels of sidewalk and replace them, or, or even we've even done some of that horizontal sawing where it's, you know, it's just a temporary fix, but again, if it'll fix it, you know, for a year or two until we can come back in with a, with a full fix, um, then, then, you know, I think that's a good, um, good strategy. So there's a lot of fixes again, sort of in the maintenance and operations realm um, that, that, that we can do without it being a full blown, you know, five year, you know, planning process and, you know, giant contract and all that business. So, um, so, so, so we will certainly have those, you know, if we're, if we're rebuilding the, doing a big roadway rebuild, we're going to sort of address things anyway, but I think there's a lot of these little situations that we can fix again, sort of in short order on the fly uh, and not, not make a big drawn out project out of it. Okay. That answer that. This is a question. Why did the study occur in 2001? More problems have resulted after 2001 and we still have a long way to go to comply with ADA. 
How often do these studies occur? So um, again, we did the early one. Um, we, we, we had some issues with the way the data was collected. It was sort of an old pencil and paper. It was a little more sophisticated than that, but, but only barely. Uh, so we're hoping, you know, I keep, I, I, I hope that this was a compre comprehensive enough. And if I can, you know, if I can keep the data up to date um, in some sort of process to do that. And that's, you know, one of the things that we're going to struggle with as we, as we roll this thing out, how do we keep that information current um, in, in valid and so forth. So uh, hopefully we can do that with some spot checking rather than a big comprehensive relook at the entire system. Uh, so, so if, if, if things work like I hope they do, then, then we won't have to do a big comprehensive you know, I'd like to thank ever again, but I won't, I won't necessarily commit to that. Okay, and this is um, from Jake Gillard. I would love to be a part of the crowdsourcing that you mentioned at the end of your presentation. How can we get involved? Um, if I sent, again, this is not necessarily something that's, that's being generated from TxDOT, but I know there's been some interest and I've gotten a couple of questionnaires lately. I know there's some research that's, uh, getting started. So, um, if you can send me, I'll try to chase down that link to, again, it's sort of preliminary. So I don't know that there's anything in place yet, but I know there's some, some folks looking at that as a potential, um, and I think it's got some great potential, um, but I will have to, I'll have to send you, I don't have that at my, that information at my fingertips. So I'll have to, I'll have to, um, send that out or get back to you guys. Okay. Nick, TAS allows a 32 inch minimum width for a two foot longitudinal direction, no closer than five feet between successive decreases in width. Does PROAG allow it? Uh, PROAG Pro wants a 48 inch minimum width. Um, so, and again, we, we will allow a 48 inch in our, even in our standards um, on, you know, very, very limited basis. You know, if you've got to squeeze down around a, say around a utility pole, squeeze the sidewalk down. Um, so we'll allow a 48, but 48 inch minimum is what I want to see on any, um, certainly on any new construction and even in our, what we call our retrofit projects where we're coming back into an existing sidewalk system and trying to, you know, remedy some of the, um, some of those things. I really strive to get that 48, um, that's that's outlined in the in the proag. Okay, proag allows running slope to match adjacent roadway. TAS does not. How do you all handle? Again, we have been um, we have been using the proag guidance, um, which which TDLR allows us to do as an option. Um, so we have been, we have been, you know, on some of our sidewalks, you just don't have any, well, you do have a choice, but it's just not a good choice. So we have basically been following the pro ag guidance, which allows us to let the sidewalk follow the, or match the, the, the grade of the adjacent road. How can I get a P, I'm sorry, that's, I meant to skip that one. Um, that's already been answered. Does your estimating tool include costs for retaining walls, right-of-way acquisition, utility relocations, or other issues in tight urban areas? Not, not necessarily. Um, again, what, what, what our um, information is intended to do is, it, and, and we do have some cost estimating value to that 
But what we want to do, if we've got right away, or if we've got severe side slopes that need some sort of retaining wall, you know, we want, I want my, you know, the engineers to, to understand some of those constraints and be able to program their projects accordingly. And if it, you know, if we need right away, we just don't have a good way of estimating what those costs would be without, you know, sort of a one-off or a case-by-case -case basis. Um, similarly, you know, retaining walls, if we, if we know there's an issue, then, then that takes a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit closer look from an engineering standpoint as to, you know, how much, how, how, how can I build it, you know, what are my constraints, um, and, and then, you know, put together, hopefully put together uh, good estimates um, at, at that time. We have a question from Laredo, Texas. Which standard do, should the municipalities be following? You know, I don't know that I can answer that for them, but uh, it makes sense to me if you're in the public right of way to use the guidance that was developed for the public rights of way. And that would be the guidance of the PROAG, understanding, you know, of course, that that is not enforceable, not enforceable either by us or by federal highways, uh, because it has not been adopted as standard either by the US DOJ or the US, you know, Department of Justice or US Department of Transportation. Um, so, you know, but I, I think some good conversation with the with the TDLR, the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation would be in order, um, you know, and make sure, make sure that we're all sort of understand, um, you know, the guidance at hand. Now, to, to also to those standards, there's a lot of our, you know, our facilities are not in the, you know, quote unquote public right of way and need to follow the 2010 standards. For instance, our safety rest areas, the 2010 standard is a better uh, playbook, if you will, for addressing all the, the accessibility needs uh, on, you know, what I would call a site or, a you know, facility is a big broad term, but, um, but the, uh, so, th so there's a lot of instances where we do fall back on the, um, on, on the 2010 ADA standards rather than the pro -Act. Okay, and we have um, sort of a, a statement and request for feedback. Uh, TDLR informed me that one may use PROAG or TA, but not both on a single project. Any comments on that? Um, yeah, there's there's been a lot of discussion on that. And what I, you know, my team to do is to, yes, if you're going to, if you're going to go with, with a, standard or a guidance, then, you know, follow it, you know, as best you can. Don't, you know, sort of try to cherry pick, oh, well, I like this width over here, but I like this slope over here. And you know what I mean? That, that doesn't leave you in a very defensible position if you're asked to um, defend, if you will, your, your design. Uh, so if, you know, if, if we can, state unequivocally that hey, we're following this standard as best we can, um, then, um, then, then I think that's, that's a more defensible position if, if you happen to find yourself having to defend your position. I apologize. Okay. Uh, did Texas undertake the assessment of the ADA, ADA assets directly or was a consultant or vendor hired to collect the data? If outsourced, what companies were retained to undertake work? So we did um, outsource uh, the data collection. We had an initial team that looked at sort of the methodology and sort of helped us put together our the concept and the tools and the methodologies. And then we ended up actually hiring three firms, um, one in North Texas, one in Central Texas, and one in sort of in South and East Texas uh, to, to do the actual data, data collection. 
All right, the Transportation and Public Works Department, excuse me, in your city, for example, in Fort Worth, we have an application as well as online on the city's website where these things can be reported. I'm not quite sure I understand the way the question was worded. I'm gonna move on to the next one if, if that person wants to clarify. Um, I am a member of ADAPT of Texas, a nonprofit advocacy organization that advocates for services such as wheelchair access features, lifts on buses, and more. Do you guys work with them on getting features improved or updated? We ha have um, certainly had communication with that group and I've, I applaud their support and their involvement. Um, I know they do, they do great work and they're a great um, advocacy group uh, and we will certainly open our doors to, to you know, working with them either directly or indirectly um, to, to um, again, to make sure sort of, sort of we're on the right path and we're, you know, have a good understanding of the, the community's needs and where we, um, you know, where, where we all want to end up. So uh, we've had some informal con uh, contact um, and um, that's, Okay. If a public sidewalk is compliant with no trip hazards, no heave or discontinuities, but water ponds about one to two inches deep during and stays after rain events, is this sidewalk considered out of compliance? It's certainly not a it's certainly not a great situation from again from that mobility standpoint. Um, and, and particularly if it's routinely ponding and causing, you know, it can cause, uh, I don't know if it's strictly out of compliance, but, it, but there is some language about, you know, don't cause ponding. Um, it, it would certainly be a, in my mind, a safety, uh, problem that we would, we would certainly want to try to address. Okay. Isn't PROAG minimum width five foot with four foot being allowed for only 200 feet than a five foot passing zone, five yard passing zone? The, the PROAG minimum width is four foot, but you're correct that five foot passing zone would be required at a minimum every 200 feet. Uh, that's part of the reason that TxDOT wanted to go with a five foot sidewalk um, so, so it, one, it's just more usable, you know, two people walking side by side can't really walk side by side on a four foot sidewalk comfortably. Um, so, so a five foot width is much more usable. It allows that passing opportunity at any spot along, you know, along the route. So you don't have to sort of wait while somebody else comes by to pass each other and so forth. So it's just much more, we feel it's a much more, um, much more usable uh, facility. Okay, the presentation talked a lot about the data that has been collected. What's the timeline for the construction implementation of this data that has been collected? So that's our, um, I don't know how many million dollar question. Um, I mean, we intend, we, we've got programs underway today. I've got, you know, projects on the drawing board today that are, that are, you know, fixing some of these things. Um, so we, we really hadn't gone through the complete prioritization process and so forth, but our goal is to get those plugged into, um, basically, I don't want to, get into the weeds with our funding and our planning operations, but basically get plugged, those projects plugged in just like any other project that we would take on. Um, so, so what that financial commitment is, I don't know. I don't have that answer today, um, but, it, but it's definitely something that, that I, I, you know, we, we need to open that discussion and, and I will tell you we've got great support from our administration and great support from our Transportation Commission. Uh, so, um, so I'm, I'm 
I, I think, again, I don't know what those numbers are going to look like at the end of the day, but, um, but, but, it, but it will certainly allow us to, to open up that, you know, start having that conversation. Okay, um, are ramps to nowhere still being installed on TechStop projects? I would love to say no, but um, I'm afraid I can't say no because every time I go around the corner, I see something that just floors me. You know, how can we still be putting this stuff in, you know, 30 years in? But, you know, I understand things happen. So our through my projects, no, we're not doing that. Um, I can't speak for the entire department that some of that isn't still going on. And, and one of the places that we do see it is when they, um, they'll they upgrade a signal system and they're sort of building for the future, if you will, put in the pedestrian signals and so forth, even though there may not be sidewalk there. Um, so we see a lot of them as, as sort of a signal system rebuild and then and then you know even though we don't have a complete sidewalk system in there they're sort of building for the future so okay. what is your intent to incorporate the ADA improvements associated with TxDOT city or MPO projects throughout the state and how will this be reflected in your existing condition data so that's to to answer the first part, uh, we definitely want to incorporate, um, and, and part of the reason we're mapping this stuff as the, you know, the project planners or the project engineers, you know, turn our levels on on their map of things to fix, it, it should be sort of right up front. Oh yeah, by the way, don't forget to fix all of these sidewalk problems while you're, you know, rebuilding this road. So. Again, I want to integrate this into our whole process, not have it be, you know, sort of what we call a silo of things going on. It needs to be, you know, sort of incorporated into our overall, uh, you know, plan development process. Um, and then my challenge will be, how do I record that information? That's, that's going to be my challenge going forward. You know, when things do get fixed, when they do get remediated, how do we go back, you know, without, without a great deal of time, effort, and money to record what got fixed. But um, it's, it need, you know, it's just one of those things that's part of our job. We just need, we need to do it. We should be inspecting construction. We should be making sure that it gets built properly. And then it, and it should be, and we're, we're working on some methodologies to make it fairly easy to go back and, and uh, document those, what we call remediation of those fixes. The presentation talked a lot about the data that has been collected. What's the time? I read that one, didn't I? He, what's the timeline for the construction implementation of this data? Yeah. I think you answered that one already. So we should be rolling all that data out in short order, um, meaning that we've already started the process, but we're, so we should be, and we're gonna be rolling that out by our TxDOT district by district. So, um, so again, if, you know, hopefully if you'll sort of communicate if, with your local offices, then you'll, um, you know, be able, be able to sort of keep track of, of the rollout of that information. What are TxDOT's construction tolerances for accessible elements, such as curb ramp slopes, sidewalk, sidewalk width, APS mounting height? Does TxDOT have different tolerances for different materials, such as concrete and asphalt? Um, we do not, well, I won't say the industry doesn't have tolerances, but as far as our accessible elements. Um, and this, this is one of the debates that's sort of going on probably around the country is, um, you know, what is the tolerance, you know, is 8.4 or 8.5% slope okay versus an 8.3? 
you know, in my mind, no, there is, there is, you know, no tolerance per se. It's either compliant or it's not compliant. Now, and the reason we're using a little bit of the, again, the, 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 the quantitative data is that, you know, am I going to go tear out a ramp that's 2.1% cross slope? Pro probably not, probably not anytime soon. Um, you know, in other words, that's sort of a little bit further down my list of immediate needs. Uh, is it non-compliant? Yes, in fact, it is non-compliant. Um, and, but, but does it make, you know, does it make sense for us as a pervert, you know, using public money to tear out something that's, um, you know, that's just, just, you know, barely off and probably, you know, most people, I'll just leave it at that. Most, um, you know, just, just barely is, you know, non, barely out of, out of that quote unquote toler, tolerance. And I believe this is our last question regarding application of installing sidewalks. So preparing this upgrade is essential, but not a 100% guarantee in Texas. Would you agree using cush, sand, et cetera? Um, yes, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think there's some, you know, construction techniques that we can use to defer some of that, um, prob, you know, problems, make it, make it last. Um, there's actually, and somebody approached me about a sort of a flexible joint system so that the, uh, the concrete would actually flex at its, at its joints, which would allow it to now, you know, it, eventually it may become that roller coaster that, that we wouldn't want, but, um, so I don't know. I think there's, there's, there's definitely some ways that we can, that we can do a little better job of, predicting when those failures uh, will be and do do some things um, to to alleviate um, alleviate or at least push push those problems a little further down the road and get a little more longevity out of our uh, installations so from what I can tell there are no more questions Okay, thank you, Deborah. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you to Pete for um, sharing TxDOT's commitment with accessibility with the rest of the state or TxDOT's commitment toward accessibility with the rest of the state. So Pete, uh, thank you so much. And then secondly, I would like to thank our partners and our partners are the, are include the American Council for the Blind of Texas, ADAPT of Texas, ArtSpark Texas, Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, Disability Rights Texas, Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, Nobility, the National Federation of the Blind of Texas, Community Attendance Equal Independence, Rev Up Texas, the Southwest ADA Center, Texas Association of the Deaf, Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities, Texas Department of License and Regulation, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, the Texas Workforce Solution, Solutions, uh, the Texas Workforce Commission, Statewide Independent Living Council, the ARC of Texas, University of Texas at Austin, Texas Center for Disability Studies, and of course, the Texas Department of Transportation. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a fantastic day.